Our second speaker this morning is Professor Stephen Williams. Uh, Stephen is the Honorary Professor of Theology at Queen's University, Belfast, Ireland. Uh, he was previously the Professor of Systematic Theology at Union Theological College, where he, served, uh, where he had served since 1994. Professor Williams is an ordained minister in the Presbyterian Church of Wales. Uh, he's published on modern epistemology in, with Revelation and Reconciliation. He's engaged uh, uh, Nietzsche's critique of Christianity in the shadow of the Antichrist. He's also been here before, uh, give, delivering our second concert lecture, concert lectures on revealed theology, later published by Erdmans with the election of grace, a riddle without res resolution. And for those of you who are part of the Trinity community, he's, Stephen is one of our resident fellows this semester working on transhumanism. So if you enjoy his talk, you can try and grab him for lunch later on. Uh, today he will be uh, talking on um, Polkinghorne. So please join me in wel welcoming Professor Stephen Williams. Thank you. I feel like telling a few jokes now. <laughs> so let me, let me start with, uh, with two jokes. Um, the first is this, that it is with trepidation I approach this particular subject, dealing with Polkinghorn, who is professionally a physicist and who calls himself an amateur theologian, because I'm not even an amateur scientist. So, uh, what can happen is that when you ask difficult questions about science at the end, I have an anglicized Welsh accent, and in responding to your questions, I shall simply enrich my English accent <laughs> considerably to give my answer such authority that you will feel utterly stupid for having asked the question. The second thing I want to say is that I had intended, well, I had prepared, actually, uh, handouts for this session, uh, but I withdrew them yesterday afternoon, uh, partly because uh, they seem to me feeble compared with uh, Kevin's handouts, which <laughs> used all kinds of long words that I'd never heard before, and mine were very feeble. But, but also, because in conversation yesterday with some people, uh, I, I was alerted to the fact that there might be an advantage in my trying to say something about how Polkinghorne responded to uh, other figures, because he responded to both Pannenberg and Torrance. So I had prepared a short critique of Polkinghorne, but I thought I might put it a show of hands. Would you prefer to hear Stephen Williams on Polkinghorn or to hear Polkinghorn instead on Pannenberg and Torrance? I don't trust this audience <laughs> to, make, to make the correct judgment there. So what I did was I've unilaterally substituted at the end of my talk. I was hoping to give a criti critique of my own. What I've done instead now, and this is why I withdrew the, the um, sheet of paper, what I've done instead is to think a little bit last night about Polkinghorne's response to Pannenberg and Torrance, which I'll therefore be presenting best I can uh, towards the end of the session. So those are my two jokes, as it were, unless the whole rest of the session is going to be a joke. Uh, and uh, on I proceed. Now, Polkinghorne is distinctive in this particular conference because he calls himself an amateur theologian, uh, professionally a physicist. Born in 1930, Polkinghorne was appointed to a new chair in mathematical physics in the University of Cambridge in 1968. A decade on from there, he was seeking ordination into the ministry of the Church of England. And after his training and a short period in parish ministry, he returned to Cambridge, first as Dean of Trinity Hall and then as President of Queen's College, from which role he retired in 1996. And a series of writings over a period of around three decades 
established him as one of the leading scientist theologians of our day. Now, <clears throat> excuse me. Now, th there are two self designations by Polkinghorne which I think are important for us to hear at the beginning of this session. One is he calls himself a scientist theologian. And it's not a casual description. He calls colleagues of his, Ian Barber, Arthur Peacock, also scientist theologians. Now, you might ask what a scientist theologian is. And I suppose it is one who approaches theology as a scientist. But as far as poking is concerned, that is not prejudicial at all in the theological enterprise because theology ought to be approached in the way the scientist approaches theology. That can be qualified little, but with the second self-designation, I'll be explaining exactly what that means. Polkinghorne valued greatly his training as a scientist, not because of his interest alone in science itself, of course, but because he thought it prepared him very well for theology. The second self-designation indicates what I have or what he has in mind here. He calls himself a bottom-up thinker. So as Gifford Lectures, uh, published in the UK under the title Science and Christian Belief, a uh, different title, perhaps The Faith of Physicists, Physicist, or something in the, U in the US, um, those lectures uh, were subtitled uh, the, uh, the Reflections of a Bottom-Up Thinker. By which he means that in science, you approach things from the standpoint of the given. You look at what's given, and you seek the best explanation for what is given. There's what you have in front of you, and there's the attempt to explain. Now, that is precisely how you're supposed to proceed in theology, as far as Polkinghorn is concerned. What is given is, for the Christian, the New Testament, and the tradition, and therefore you operate off that and seek the best explanation for the presence in, let us say, the New Testament of what is present in it. That is bottom-up thinking. And there is some added weight given to that process by the fact that Polkinghorn uh, holds that we should have a natural theology that the investigation of the world discloses the high possibility or probability of the existence of God, or to get away from that terminology, God is the best explanation for the world. Uh, he's really here, is operating with a version of the anthropic principle. The fine tuning of the universe is such that it points in the direction of a creator as far as he's concerned. And then, of course, uh, when he examines the New Testament documents, he finds the witness to the resurrection, and he finds that witness to be credible. All of that, therefore, encourages him in the enterprise of bottom-up thinking common to both science and theology. Now, Polkinghorne's thinking on creation is embedded in his view of the relationship of science to theology. They, says Polkinghorne, are cousins under the skin. In addition to what I just said about the similarity in approach in science and theology, uh, Polkinghorne also uh, insists that critical realism applies in both science and theology. His conclusion as a scientist in the realist uh, direction is steered more by the practice of scientists than a philosophy of science. Although he makes remarks on Kuhn and Popper in relation to philosophy of science, what, what Polkinghorne wants to emphasize is that practicing science, scientists are well aware that they are trying to find out things and often are finding out things about the world as it is. It's not definitive, it's not ultimate, it's not incorrigible, it's not unrevisable. Uh, but nevertheless, there is what he calls very similitude. Uh, and therefore, his favorite philosopher of science is Michael Polanyi, whose name came up yesterday in some context, 
because Polanyi actually knew what he's talking about as a scientist. He wasn't simply philosophizing about it. And those who work in the scientific community are instinctively, intuitively, practically realists, albeit uh, critical realists when they think about it. So he arrives at critical realism in science in that way, uh, and as far as he's concerned, also in theology, you shed critical realism. Both the New Testament and the tradition and reflecting on Christian uh, thought and faith should persuade you that you are seeking in theology to deal with the real and living God. Your understanding of him is not definitive, is not unrevisable, but you are dealing with a knowledge of God. And that's one thing he likes about Tom Torrance, though I'll come later to his difficulties with Tom Torrance and even slightly severer difficulties with Wolfhard Pannenberg. Okay, so much for some generally, general introductory remarks. Now, what about Polkinghorne's thinking about creation in particular? Now, he wrote an early trilogy, which some regard as the best, still the best guide to his work. Uh, One World, Science and Creation, Science and Providence. These are works of the 1980s. But that trilogy was actually preceded by a work called The Way the World Is. And the fact that The Way the World Is preceded that early and in some ways uh, uh, foundational trilogy of Polkinghorns, the fact The Way the World Is uh, preceded that indicates the direction I think we should take in looking at this understanding of creation. Let's start where Polkinghorn starts with what science discloses about uh, the created order, the cosmos, which as far as Polkinghorne is concerned, is God's creation. Now, uh, Polkinghorne, uh, though he wants to uh, modify a challenge at certain points, the neo-Darwinian understanding of evolution, Polkinghorne uh, predictably works with the standard uh, world picture. Uh, of uh, the age of the universe, the Big Bang, uh, evolutionary history. So that's not surprising. But he is keen in talking about creation on emphasizing the radical significance, radical in terms of the history of science, of uh, 20th century developments in uh, quantum theory and in chaos theory. He was, of course, himself. Uh, an expert and, and wrote on quantum theory. He's written more than one work on quantum, including of introductory kinds. With quantum theory, we find a world with indeterminacy operating at the micro level. And indeterminacy is not a word to be casually used. Because Bogingon holds actually that quantum does reveal that there is indeterminacy. That is to say, it is not simply uncertainty. It's not Heisenbergian uncertainty, that is, we don't know, but it's actual ontological indeterminacy we're talking about. Chaos reveals that at a macro level. History does not have to take the history of nature does not have to take one course rather than the other. There are necessities, there are regularities. But chaos theory is disclosed as a world in which things can turn out uh, in the history of the world dramatically different from what they might have done. There is contingency, therefore, entailed as far as Polkin is concerned in chaos theory. And therefore, what he emphasizes in terms of the scientific world picture is the openness of the world, the genuine openness of the world as disclosed by modern science. And this leads Polkinghorne to speculate on causality, a speculation which will turn out to be important uh, when I think of the connections he makes with theology uh, a bit later. The, uh, the 
exchange between uh, uh, Christoph and myself later uh, should be an interesting one here. I think he, on behalf perhaps of Pannenberg, I, on behalf of Polkinghorne, even though he might not agree with Pannenberg and I might not agree with Polkinghorne, even so, uh, this, this will be interesting, I think. Uh, Polkinghorne emphasizes informational causality. What does he mean? Well, if he sounds vague on this, and if I'm going to sound vague on this, it's because we are still working out what information is. But the point he wants to make is this, that people have been used to thinking of the world in terms of energetic causalities. And that has sometimes led people to reductionism, to the desire to explain uh, human action and uh, cosmic processes in terms of the most micro level you can get to. But increasingly, Polkinghorne and others have come to think that there's another kind of causality operative, a top-down kind of causality, which is non-energetic. It can be put a little more technically than that, but he sometimes will use that, so I will use it too. It's non-energetic. It is a pattern-shaping causality which can't be uh, understood in energetic categories. An example he will give, I'm not standing by this, nor am I demurring from it, an example because I'm simply expounding him here, the example he gives is of the raising of the arm. The raising of the arm, he thinks, is an action of the whole person. But somehow it is pattern forming in a way which, and I might not have raised that arm, in a way which can't be understood in energetic ways. It is information. That's the word we have for it. Now, uh, at this stage, I, I find myself um, wanting input from scientists because there is a very well-known apologist, conservative Christian apologist, whose name will be known to you all, and I'm not going to mention the name, who is a top-flight mathematician. Uh, and a biologist said to me the other day, but he simply uses the word information as a mathematician would, not as a biologist would. Uh, so here we are talking about sciences, but actually scientists will talk differently from each other, although, of course, that's mathematics, which you may not want to count uh, as science. But Polkin was a mathematical physicist, so the two things come together there. So uh, Polkinghorne's uh, interest, when he looks at the world is closed uh, to science, his interest lies in the openness, quantum and chaos, the complexity of systems, the dynamic complexity of systems, and particularly what for him turns out to be increasingly significant, uh, the concept of information. Okay, so much then uh, for uh, creation or uh, cosmos, because he regarded it as creation, from a scientific point of view. What then about creation from a theological point of view? Jeff, when did I start? I didn't notice. Roughly 9.50, okay, so I'll keep going till about 10.30 or so, right, or 35, yeah. Okay, well. Three forms of creation. Creatio ex nihilo, creatio continua, nova creatio. Creation from nothing, continual creation, and the new creation. Polkinghorne uh, holds to creation ex nihilo, but he says that there's a common mistake being made here that people think of that in terms of the temporality of the beginning. Now, Polkinghorn is not uh, denying uh, that there is a temporal beginning to the world, but he's not particularly concerned if uh, our notions of temporality here get messed around by scientists, um, because in the end, Creation out of nothing really has to do with the dependence of all things on God. To emphasize, when you're talking about creation of nothing, uh, a point, a temporal beginning point, is to make a mistake, even though he's not denying that there is such a point. He invests a lot in creatio continua, continuing creation. Now, uh, listening to... Um, Bradley yesterday, I don't know if he's here today, on uh, Warfield. Uh, Warfield. I said to myself, I, I think 
Poking Hall will be sympathetic to this response, following response to Warfield. I think Poking Hall might say, um, creation and providence are dogmatic categories. Even if we draw the dogmatic categories somehow to scripture and make use of biblical vocabulary sometimes, nevertheless, they're dogmatic categories. And it doesn't particularly matter under which dogmatic category you study a particular phenomenon. Let's talk, therefore, about a phenomenon like water into wine or world processes or uh, the soul being created and so forth. Let's talk about all those, but let's hear what we want to say about that rather than getting hung up on whether it's a question of creation or providence. I think that's what Polkinghorne might say, uh, which is just a, an elaborate way of my saying that he runs together, uh, creatio continua and providence to a large extent. Not everything which could be called providence uh, can be called creatio continua, but creatio continua does the job which many people regard providence as uh, rightly doing. So, Poking on then, when he wrote Science and Creation and followed it up with Science and Providence, in going on to talk about providence, he didn't see himself as talking about something actually different from creation, but he was just simply tackling uh, a wider range of themes and going into more detail about what he said in Science and Creation in some respects. And then he holds also to the new creation, Nova Creatio. Uh, and very interestingly, at this point, this, this is the major point in Pokemon's work where he, he uh, goes against the science, as it were, because scientific predictions are uh, pessimistic about uh, the end of the world. Um, uh, how it's going to happen, whether the big freeze or the big crunch, well, there's disagreement there. But on no scenario at the moment, he emphasizes, um, are things going to work out happily and well. Things are going to collapse, finish. But, but where, where Polkinghorne finds in the scientific account of openness a consonance with theology, here he finds, of course, a dissonance with theology, but he insists on the eschatological new creation, despite everything the scientists are saying, which is, I think, one reason for suggesting he's not in thrall to science. There are points where you might wonder whether he's being constrained excessively by science in his theological thinking, but this is certainly a point where he's not constrained by science at all. The new creation is a cre creation creatio ex vetere, a creation out of the old, not a creatio ex nihilo. It's radical, but it is not uh, entirely discontinuous. Now let me come to what is widely and rightly regarded, I think, as distinctive in Polkinghorne's view of creation, which is his view of creation as kenosis. <clears throat> and I want to mention two people here, uh, two influences on him. One is someone whom he said was the major theological influence on him, uh, Jürgen Moltmann. And the other is a less well-known name, W.H. Vanstone. A single work by Vanstone called Love's Endeavor, Love's Expense. More than one work of Maltman's uh, influences poking on here. So what's going on? Maltman in uh, The Trinity and the Kingdom of God and in God and in Creation. Um, Maltman raises a question which he says has simply not been thought of in the Christian tradition for the most part, though it has been thought of in the Jewish tradition. The question is this, how can a God who is omnipresent actually create anything outside himself? There is no outside. If God is omnipresent, there is no outside to create into, just not possible. Remember here, I'm simply humbly describing all I'm, that's all I'm doing. I'm only saying what other people are saying. I'm keeping myself well, well hidden here. Okay, even though the, that comment is probably a giveaway already, right? Uh, okay, so as Maltman says, so Maltman says that therefore for God to create, it had to be that he had to create the space within himself. So God withdraws 
in movement, or withdrawal, or self-contraction. Pictorially, and I think this is one of the problems, actually, that has to be addressed to what extent uh, we are, as Wittgenstein said, being misled by pictures, how pictures and concepts are related. But, but there I'm apostrophizing for a minute. Anyway, the, the point is the picture is that God withdraws and creates the space um, into which he creates. So two movements in creation. God's withdrawal, so that there's a space within him, uh, as it were, and from which he absents himself, that's the nihil, and then God creates in that nihil, the world uh, as we know it. That's one strand. Another strand is uh, the reasoning of uh, Van Stone. And Van Stone uh, impressed Polkinghorne immensely. As Polkinghorne says, he's impressed my colleagues as scientists, theologians, uh, Barber and Peacock. Van Stone effectively, in his book, uh, Love's Endeavor, Love's Expense, effectively allows a phenomenology of love to control to a large extent. Now, this is my way of putting it rather than poking horn. I'm using the word control, so I'm giving you my own description here of what happens in Van Stone. He allows phenomenology of love to control what may be said about the love of God. So we know that love is not controlling. We know that love is patient. We know that love is vulnerable. Uh, if I am controlling and impatient and invulnerable, I'm not being loving. Now, that is the case. We cannot ascribe to God control. We cannot say he determines everything. We cannot say he's invulnerable. We cannot say, say he sets out programs for the cosmos and makes quite sure that he re realizes them. That is not love. Now, no doubt, with both Fanston and Polkinghorne, they arrive at that view of God from reflection on Scripture itself. Whether you think it's well arrived at or not, they, they uh, seek to do that. But it's, with Fanston, it's certainly the description of human love that comes first and tells us what love must be. He, he does qualify a little bit how that carries over into theology, but not very significantly, not in any way that affects this argument. So, for God to create is a kind of kenosis. It's a setting aside of certain powers and capacities, at least in their active exercise, and one might go beyond that. There are four forms of kenosis that uh, Polkinghorne talks about. This comes up in an important um, essay on kenotic creation and divine action, which you find in a volume which he edited, actually dedicated to Vanston. Vanston died before the conference was held, um, whose papers were gathered together in this volume. Maltman himself contributes to it. It's called The Work of Love. Maltman contributes an essay on kenosis in it. And Polkinghorne says there are four forms of divine kenosis which are involved in creation. First, there's the kenosis of omnipotence. God allows evolutionary history to make itself. More than once, he, uh, in, in the course of his works, he quotes Charles Tingsley's uh, famous words when the origin of the species came out. Charles Kingsley, Anglican clergyman, said, you know, God, I now see God's even greater than I thought before because God not only creates, but he creates things that can create themselves. Good on you, Darwin. You've seen that bit, although sadly you've dropped God out of it. Okay, so firstly, God allows evolutionary history to make itself. Gives freedom to processes in creation, not just humans, but to processes in the non-human creation. Secondly, there is the kenosis of simple eternity, as Polkinghorne puts it. In bringing forth creation, God added, as it were, a temporal pole to his deity in order to interact canonically with creation. It's process language, but uh, only language. Uh, consistently, um, Polkinghorne, who's been taken to be a process theologian, uh, consistently, Polkinghorne says that he's not a process theologian, but at this point, he borrows the vocabulary and makes happy use of it. 
So there's secondly, the kenosis temple of simple eternity and bringing forth creation, God added a temporal pole to his deity in order to interact kenotically with creation from within it, for God to experience time from within time. Thirdly, there is the kenosis of omniscience. Now, this sentence will drive some of us mad. Uh, no, sorry, I'm conceiving myself, aren't I? It will drive some of you mad, my, my dear uh, brothers and sisters. I simply quote him here. Kenosis of omniscience, the future does not yet exist. And this leads to the belief that even God does not yet know it. The future does not yet exist. And this leads to the belief that even God does not yet know it. Now, poking on here, actually, I will make one critical point. He doesn't distinguish here between a logical truth and another kind of truth, a metaphysical truth. Um, sometimes he seems to say the future just does not exist, so it can't be known by God, in the same way in which God cannot see a house which doesn't exist. Not even God can see a house which doesn't exist. He sometimes is, is broadly speaking, about a logical truth of that kind, in which case the kenosis doesn't come into it. That is the case whether or not there's a kenosis. Kenosis is, is uh, metaphysically irrelevant. But sometimes he talks in terms of a state of affairs into which God has brought himself. God has brought himself to a point where he cannot know the future. The future is not there to be known. The fourth move is the most uh, interesting, in a way, in terms of his doctrine of creation. There is the kenosis of causal status. Polkinghorn had opined and never gave up the opinion that when we talk about divine causality, we must be talking about different kind of causality from energetic causalities in the cosmos. And an analogy might be, he is tentative, but, but he pushes it, analogy might be um, what I said about the raising of my arm. God acts through pure informational output. The way God is causal is not in the way uh, material and energetic things are causal, but he acts through pure informational output on the creation. And that for him was an important move to make. But then he began to think, well, wait a minute. Um, if there is kenosis on the part of God, would it not be perhaps part of his, of his majestic condescension and self-giving that he should be prepared to act as a cause in the same way as causes act in the cosmos. Could not God condescend to be a causally energetic um, uh, agent, not, not simply causing in the informational sense, but actually being cause amongst causes in the same way as things work in this world? <clears throat> now, he doesn't give examples, but uh, I don't think they, they're difficult to come up with. Um, supposing I say to you, you know, I'm moved by my spirit. My spirit causes me to um, embrace you with affection or comfort you in your sorrow. My spirit's moved me to do that. Um, well, in the same way, God's Holy Spirit might be in me moving me to do that. That's the same sort of causation to work. God has condescended to allow his spirit to work in the same way as my spirit would work. Or if um, the perturbations of a butterfly's wings um, causes a wind elsewhere in the world, well, God can also, in a non-informational way, now in an energetic way, God can also, by his spirit, cause perturbations so that things happen. That's part of his condescension. That's the move that uh, Pokemon makes to secure the fourth kind of causality. Now, this is the point at which I was going to um, make my own critical remarks, but uh, to be quite serious about it, I think it's going to be much more helpful for this conference if I state what he had to say uh, about Torrance and Pannenberg. I I'm certainly willing for what it's worth to give my own uh, responses to things, but that can come out later, either in questions or panel later. So now let me represent Polkinghorne uh, in relation to Torrance and um, uh, Pannenberg. 
uh, this, is, this is something I, I worked on last night. I was familiar with a lot of it, but I just needed to check certain things. So, but I'm willing to stand by it, although there may be one of two things um, I would, reflecting on it, put a bit differently. But I'm willing to stand by what I'm going to say here. Polkinghorne's comments on Torrance, um, up until uh, Faith, Science and Understanding, which came out in the year 2000, Polkinghorne's comments on Torrance are uh, positive. And he doesn't drop that when it comes to a discussion in Faith, Science and Understanding. He's favorable to Torrance. Uh, he is glad that Torrance, uh, this is the way now he understands Torrance, whether rightly or wrongly, he's glad that Torrance thinks of natural science and theology as partners in the single quest to understand the one world. Very glad of what you were saying yesterday, Kevin, you know, knowing things in accordance with th that which is to be known, that the structure of our knowing must correspond to that which is known. Uh, glad that Torrance is saying that. Glad that Torrance is critical realism. Relational view of space, which again you <coughs> mentioned yesterday. But Torrance and Pannenberg misunderstand Einstein. They really misunderstand Einstein here. Pannenberg um, is even worse uh, than uh, Torrance. What Torrance says is that we ought to have been taught uh, with and since Einstein is to think of a field. I'm coming to comment more on the word field in a minute with Pannenberg, but a field, a space-time continuing continuum interacting with matter or with the energy of the universe in such a way that the connections now operative within that continuum and structure, the connections are non-causal. But, says Polkinghorne, Einstein never encouraged anything like a non-causal way of looking at the way a field works. You, you, if you're looking for causal openness, you, you don't look in that direction at all. He looked at things like quantum, to chaos particularly. Things, I mean, Einstein was, was uh, unhappy with quantum. It bothered him. It didn't fit into his way of seeing things. He was a classical physicist. Uh, quantum messes you up if, you, if you're looking for order and structure and causality in the tight sense. So, so you're not going to get much help from Einstein. Uh, if you're actually looking to loosen things up causally, it's quantum, chaos, complexity that'll do that. So while Torrance is, um, is doing some good things, including the way he relates geometry to physics, I was very interested yesterday that um, neither of you talked about the particular analogy uh, not that you should have, by the way, at all, not suggesting that, of course. But neither of you talked about the analogy which Torrance put to Bart about geometry and physics, uh, which, which is something which one of us might explain later. But anyway, um, Polkinghorne welcomes that uh, in Torrance. But still, Torrance doesn't quite get Einstein right. Pannenberg. Well, Poking on uh, welcomes what engagement Pannenberg has with uh, the natural sciences. Doesn't go into much detail as Pokinghorn wants, but he welcomes that ambition. He welcomes Pannenberg's emphasis on God as a comprehensive principle of explanation. Poking on holds that you should have natural theology, systematic theology, and what you could call a philosophical theology, or a kind of comprehensive metaphysical outlook as you try as a theologian to understand everything. He, he likes the way in which uh, Pannenberg uh, goes for that last one uh, in particular, and of course uh, the other forms. Uh, he, he appreciates Pannenberg's 
emphasis on uh, evidence for the resurrection that this is, as a Christian theologian, something you must insist on. It is part of Pokemon's bottom-up thinking that you look at the evidence for the resurrection. He enjoys that in Pannenberg. But Pannenberg misunderstands field theory, says Pokinghorn. Misunderstands field theory. This is a statement Pannenberg makes. I rather think that the modern conceptions of field and energy went a long way to spiritualize physics. I rather think that the modern conceptions of field and energy went a long way to spiritualize physics. Pokemon says, uh, to talk about field as spiritualizing something to a physicist is rather like talking about a tenuous sort of gas as spiritual. Field theory does not uh, take you away from the material. E equals mc squared. Taken to be telling us uh, that matter is energetic. Actually, says poking on, it equally, tell you, equally tells you that energy is material. Theologians have got too excited about what's happening here and got it wrong. So what they think has happened is that a picture of uh, atoms whizzing around in a void has been replaced by this field, and the, the, the collocation of atoms, therefore, uh, is not thought of in the same way, and we are beginning to move away from crude material causality. But actually, uh, says Poking on, the field doesn't spiritualize anything at all. The field is just an extended kind of system. It's almost, he says, he uses this language, is almost like a collection of parts. So don't think that you can move, as Pannenberg wants to move, from field in science in the direction of spirit. You, you, you cannot uh, do that. That's what he has to say. And uh, it being 10.35, the wisdom of Stephen Williams on these matters must lie forever buried. <laughs> Deep in his heart and mind, um, unless, of course, you are desperately eager to bring it out. Thank you very much. Just a question about the process of doing theology and doing science. Yeah. It, it seems that scientists, especially now, um, <coughs> science requires collaboration, but it also involves peer review. As a scientist, I'm, I'm observing all of these theologians kind of working on their own. Maybe I'm wrong. Is there, is there more collaboration, or should there be more collaboration between theologians on these issues? Uh, but also now a collaboration of scientists and theologians so we don't continue to make these kinds of mistakes where we misunderstand each other. It would certainly seem that if a collaboration between scientists and theologians is to be fruitful, there must be prior collaboration between theologians or scientists will know which theologians to talk to and will get different answers according to the theologians they talk to. Should there be, how much collaboration is there? I find it a very hard one to answer. It may be, you know, in New Zealand, Germany, in the States, um, in the UK, different answers might be given. Um, theology, to anyone who comes to theology with any kind of presupposition about what it will say, or experience of many other disciplines, 
to anyone, it, it'll seem the theology is just all over the place. That it sometimes seems as if, if you looked at everything which goes under the title theology in the world, and asked what is it that holds these things together, that the only answer you can possibly give to that is something like um, the memory of Jesus as liberator or something. You know, there, all theology might have that somewhere. Uh, but theology as practice is so incredibly diverse that, yes, uh, I think more collaboration is needed, but it may be that many people say, but actually a lot of collaboration is going on. Loose answer. Good question, though. Steve Wong in the back, and then this gentleman down here. <coughs> Thank you, Stephen. That was uh, illuminating. I, I wanted to push a little bit about the and, and push poking horn, not, not you, of course, on the um, um, consanguinity between the scientific method and theology, that there are these datum that are given and that you work from the bottom up with these given datum. It seems to me that one thing all theologians, at least Christian, Jewish, and Muslim, would agree upon is that God is not an object in the world to be indicated. So we can't begin thinking, okay, so we have these data points. And we're going to collect these data points even from Scripture, and then we're going to know something about who God is. And, and I just wonder if that's why there's so much revisionist account of the deity in modern theology, precisely because we've narrated God internal to the Scripture, and you can only be a, a, a temporal character if you're internal to the Scripture, and we've neglected the fact that God's the author of Scripture, and therefore we have to do this work of abstraction. Um, uh, in that sense, the best place to identify God in Scripture would be these theophanic manifestations that don't make sense, like, uh, you know, a burning bush, uh, where it really messes with uh, the, the easy narrative character of God. Does, does Polkinghorne neglect that? Does, uh, does Panningberg uh, neglect that? Um, even, even Torrance, I, I, I wonder. I don't know. I would make, uh, thanks very much for that. I'd make three points in response. The first is a very quick one, uh, though others may want to speak to this. I don't think Pannenberg or Torrance neglect that, as a matter of fact. So secondly, on Polkinghorne himself, it is arresting, as far as I'm concerned, uh, how little Polkinghorne uh, does with the contours of biblical theology, or if that sounds already too set, with the biblical data when constructing his doctrine, for example, of creation. When he's talking about eschatology, he will go back to the Bible uh, much more. But if you ask yourself, well, you know, when he talks about divine love and foreknowledge and all those things and divine temporality, um, how is he thinking of the biblical material here? You'd find that there's very little reference to it and very little sign of a struggle with it. He emphasizes, uh, certainly, uh, truthfully, the importance of Scripture for him devotionally. But in the construction of his theology, it plays, to my mind, a surprisingly small part. Now, well, it's got to be careful. You know, not everything is going to be on the surface. He's a physicist who expresses himself economically. He's not going to tell you everything about where he got things from. Even so, there's a marked absence. The third thing I'd say is... Um, your point about the differences in consanguinity is very important, I think. Polkinghorne, I'm glad of the opportunity to say this, Polkinghorne does not deny that theology, uh, when it gets going, proceeds in different ways from science in certain respects. I mean, he says, you know, theology is dealing with things here which science can't possibly. We're obviously entering the realm science can't, and things like religious experience and mysticism uh, are things to be taken into account when we reflect on um, how theological knowledge is arrived at. But it's the beginning point and the starting point uh, and the way it all gets going. It's there that you find the similarities. Both of them ought really to start by looking at what's in front of them and asking what's the best, best explanation of what's in front of us. Now, later on, you know, science is not going to get it, go as far as theology, and it's going to look at different things from theology, of course. Both of them are... Uh, cousins under the skin in that respect. Uh, that may not be an adequate answer, but the best I think I can give uh, briefly on Pokemon's behalf. 
Come in the back. <coughs> Danny Huck will be next. Mm. Hello. Okay, that's on. Uh, thanks. I'm not as uh, familiar with poking horn, so thank you for presenting this. Uh, so I'm wondering about his understanding of love and definition there, which then w leads into what seems like a kind of a canonic open theism. Mm. Um, and so I'm wondering if like his, his doctrine of love too dichotomistic, like either determinism or not, and uh, what, or then how would he also respond to like a charge of open theism there kind of thing? I think he's asking for your opinion. Jeff says you think asking for my opinion. I'm happy to give my opinion uh, anytime. Um, he he does not. I have not uh, noticed him refer to open theism. I, I think once I encountered a reference to open theism, but when he began writing in the 80s, uh, he wouldn't have been reading the early open theist stuff. I think. But he's, he's coming to uh, similar conclusions, uh, certainly on the issue of foreknowledge and freedom. Now, does he work with uh, a false dichotomy? That's one way of putting it. I would accept that. Another way of putting it would be that he is... He, he's not really attending to the way in which uh, love and divine um, governance are related in the biblical materials. Obviously, they're not related there on the surface. You have to work at that, extrapolate, but he's not really attending to that. So that he's, um, he, he is putting upon theology the kind of external pressure or imposition of a dichotomous scheme in some respects, I think you're right, uh, which we ought to challenge theologically. It's interesting, you see, Maltman uh, makes the comment, and here I sympathize with Maltman at this point, that where we're wrestling with this question of divine freedom and divine necessity in relation, say, to creation, Maltman remarks that in God that distinction breaks down between freedom and necessity. Now, with qualifications, I, I, I think Maltman's on to something. What Pokemon does not do is apply that kind of reasoning to the whole question of love and control. Neither does Maltman. I mean, he follows Maltman more or less here uh, as well, although it's Vanston he's explicitly following on that particular point. Uh, Maltman will create antitheses also between the almighty God and the loving God. So that is a very long-winded Welsh way of saying, I agree. Stephen, can I follow up on that briefly? Uh, in Christoph's talk, he invoked information as well, and yeah. he did it uh, over, if I understood it correctly, against causality and in favor of a hermeneutical uh, and communicative paradigm. It seemed like Polkinghorne was invoking communication, uh, information in a causal way. Could you, would you be comfortable uh, commenting it yeah. on similarities and differences in a causal versus a communicative account of information? Yes, again, I, as with open theism, he, he doesn't deal with communication. He, he makes some references to it, uh, as I recall, but he certainly doesn't deal with it on anything like a theoretical level. It seems to me quite consistent with Polkinghorne's uh, thought to say that the language of causality, which he continues to tie to information, is something which you'd regard as negotiable. That in as much as, in any case, uh, divine informational causality is not causality of the same border as energetic causality, in as much as that is its analogy, uh, that gives us a little bit of freedom to ask whether it might be expressed in a different way. But of course, what you might say to me is, well, I'm not expressing a different way. I'm really inventing something entirely new here. Uh, and I think that Polkinghorn, whether out of deference to the tradition or for a more solid metaphysical reason, would probably want to retain the language of causality. But I, I, I would 
I think there is some flexibility there. I would not want to foreclose the issue as far as Pokemon is concerned. And I may have missed something in his literature here where he does actually comment on uh, communication. Uh, Danny Hawk down here. <coughs> Could you say a little bit more about Polkinghorne's view of Caratio X Vetera? And like how would he yeah, yeah, like the his eschatology in light of oh. the destruction of the universe or the destruction of this planet, those kind of things. How would he frame that? Would he put that in terms of a conflict between science and theology, or what's the category he would use to describe it? Yes, he doesn't actually use the word conflict, I think, uh, because in his context, he's aware that one of the ways in which the relation of science and religion has been regarded has been in conflictual terms. So I don't think he actually uses the word conflict, but what he says is that you cannot extrapolate from science at all um, what uh, you hold theologically. And furthermore, that science ought to allow for a God who can do something different from what is scientifically prog prognosticated. So, I mean, in terms of the, the structure then of his thinking, he, he holds to some form of uh, continuity. Uh, and I mean, I can, I can spell that out, the metaphysics of it a little bit, but it's not, uh, it's, it's only conflict if science is going to insist that there is no divine action of any kind possible which can reverse the direction in which things are going. As far as Polkinghorne is concerned, there can be some divine action, although he is a rad quite a radical discontinuist in some ways. So it's God taking the material of this present world and refashioning it in some sense, eschatologically, he's talking about. He, he, he allows, as far as possible, for cosmic processes to be as they are described by science, but in the end, it won't end up like that. How then God's going to do it, he doesn't pretend to know. Time for one more question down here. Um, so I was wondering if, uh, with the uh, Warfield presentation, we learned that um, the, some of the evolutionary discussions were a lot more, um, a lot less monolithic than we we generally think. And uh, I know Polkinghorne was a um, he, he followed evolutionary theory. Was he working with Darwinian evolution, or did he kind of uh, interact with more dynamic and nuanced uh, theories of evolution? In uh, the discussions I'm used to uh, on evolution, uh, the major alternative amongst biologists to near the neo-Darwinian synthesis is punctuated equilibrium, meta-Darwinism. And I have not seen any reference by Polkinghorne to that. So I've not seen him engage. Again, he may do so at certain points or certain sentences, but there's certainly no significant engagement with non-Darwinian evolutionary ways of thinking. But he, d he does think that uh, in the Darwinian or neo-Darwinian way of looking at things, you can't actually account for everything you should account for. There must be some other factors at work than those specified by neo-Darwinians. The, 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 the sort of basic natural selection paradigm, however much then refined and um, tweaked and nuanced, that kind of paradigm arising uh, from within the Darwinian tradition, that cannot be adequate as an evolutionary description. That's what he says. Please join me in thanking Stephen Williams.